Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. We uh, had a special visitor come back to Pemberton, and I'd like to introduce Linda K. Thompson. She was born in Miller, but she left the valley uh, in the late 60s. She is a writer and uh, was looking for a venue to do a poetry reading. So we were thrilled that she wanted to come back to the museum. And uh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Linda. She lives and writes in Port Alberni today. And she started writing classes at North Island College in 2001. She's been encouraged by poet instructor Derek Hainbury. And she also attended the Victoria School of Writing for three summer sessions with instructors Sherry D. Wilson, Susan Musgrave, and Susan Stenson. She also studies, or uh, has studied yearly with Patrick Lee in his Glen Airlie and Honeymoon Bay retreats on southern Vancouver Island, and has been privileged to attend workshops with Ellen Bass, Marie Howe, Dorianne Lowe, and Joseph Miller. She says her writing is influenced by growing up in Pemberton and the landscape and the people here, and uh, we're really glad that you wanted to come back to Pemberton for this. So. It's a unique thing we're doing here. We've never done a poetry reading before, so thanks for coming out. Thank you. Did you see the big slide? Did you try to <laughs> <laughs> That was great. Well, this is my little book that I put together. I did it myself. I thought, you know, I could wait till I'm 80 before somebody else wants to publish this book. So. Just wanted to get these poems out there, and, and it's back there. And some of you have it already. And uh, I'm going to read three poems from that, and some some other poems that haven't made it into a book yet, and a couple of my newer ones. So this is called Coast Mountain Valley, and it's from from the chapbook, and it's in three parts. Number one. I leave the yard in the August dawn, gun the knocking rambler up the driveway. Only the horses notice, nodding their noses over the twisted planks of the pasture fence. Potato fields stretch from the road to the mountains, a dark bright green you can almost taste. In a month the tops will be killed, lie burnt and lifeless, ready for digging. Seven miles from farm to town, we rode in the back, would close our eyes, chant the root, yell it into the wind, voices of girls who were not afraid. Uncle Robbie's, Ryan Creek, First Rock Slide, Curved by the Slough, Miller Creek, Uncle Morgan's, Double Turn, Lundgren's, Taylor's Corner, Second Rock Slide, Stop Sign in front of the bank, Town. By 68, I'm ready to go, work the early shift at the hotel, buy myself Judge Decker's car after he dies, and one October day, the cottonwoods alight, drive south on 99, past the fields, the rivers, the mountains, the blackbirds, and the green gauge. I don't know then, but the place will follow me, old dog who won't turn back. This is a poem I wrote after reading one of Billy Collins, where he was explaining to students how to write a poem. It's also from the chapbook. Stand up for the wallflower words. I am somewhat afraid of poems. I do not wish to wrestle the belligerent ones into submission, nor do I wish to flood them with plea light get to the guts. A poem like that, I find it sensible to avoid. In fact, I would march myself right out of that cell, and even as the lifers are rattling their stanzas on the bars, I will be looking for an outside door. Bring me a poem of light and shadow, noonday sun, glaciers, aspens that rattle in the four o'clock wind. Bring verses filled with meat and potatoes, Chevrolets and tapioca. 
write to me about three-legged races and dear uncle who came to put down the dog. Show me breath rising from a beaver house and the smell of August raked hay. Bring me a brother with periwinkle eyes, sisters who remember. Bring a Sears catalog, an aerogram from Poland, homesickness. I am telling you this. There were four small people in sturdy shoes, a dog named Bob. They lived in a house bordered with gooseberries and red currants. They slept on their wedding ring quilts. Beside the potato fields, between the rivers, write these words. This is a poem called Margaret. I wrote it about Margaret Mitchell, who I always wondered how she was doing. And we went to see her one day. <laughs> Margaret. Back in the 60s, Margaret and I went on a double blind date with two guys from the forestry crew. Isn't it strange, the parts we remember so clearly? I went to visit Margaret last spring. I've thought about her all these years. She's up in the caribou raising sheep, alone now since she broke up with her partner and then her old dad, George, died. She showed us around all the sheds she's built, the corrals and feeding stalls, the lambing barn where she's nailed old framed pictures on the dusty whitewashed two by four walls and a radio plays tinny cowboy music faintly to soothe the new mothers. Dawn and I have a friend, Kirk, who just couldn't seem to make it, get a good job out of BC. So he moved back to Saskatchewan. Kirk. In Aylesbury, Saskatchewan, you can buy a house on a visa. So Kirk maxed his car and moved out last year. He bought one house and then another. He uses number two for his BC bud crop. He's thinking of picking up the hotel next spring. It's just a faded two-story with a retro neon sign out front. Way out the highway, you can see the letters flashing, hot, Hot, hot. The bar is down a couple steps and dark like a basement. Every wall is filled with shelves of knickknacks, all elephants. When tourists wander in from the highway, it takes a minute or two for their eyes to adjust. Kirk says he has no plans to clear the place out once he makes the deal. He says he rode an elephant or two in Bangladesh. And he tips the chair and rests his feet on his own porch chair. Track line on the Little at 1935. Last week, while checking beaver snares on his track line, Mr. Henry Erickson was chased up a tree by a grizzly. Mr. Erickson went back later to look at the tree and reported. There are no branches for the first 10 feet. When asked to comment, Mrs. Erickson replied, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. <laughs> of course, I have to have a poem for Mom and one for Dad. This is one of the first poems I wrote. If you can believe it, I was in Mallorca. And the instructor said, I want you to go and write down all the things that you will never want to write a poem about. And one of them was about how the women that came to, to the valley, most of them were, for somewhere, were from somewhere else. But the fathers had sort of always been here. And we'd always been here, so the moms were the ones that were different. But I was never going to write about that. Mihai. We were all from here. Dad's childhood place is ours. The flat, steep-sided valley, all we knew. Same gray soil where he had run, clung like cold forged dust to our pale legs. We knew the smell, 
potato vines grew up past our skinny, dirt ringed necks. We knew hay, hay field stubble, how to pinch and slide our toes along the moor tracks. Knew since birth the slant of sheds, the line of swamp killed cedars, knew the rock slide, knew the beaver pond. We lived where he had lived forever, but she was from away. We had never seen prairie, could not imagine mother, where all that grew was dust and scrub. They came from away. What kind of family ties their bed to a tin box truck, drives out a rutted yard, past coolies, scrub, the blue clay hills, never turning back. Little mother, sparrow perched, on a horsehair mattress. Around her, stacked like markers, in graveyards they would visit no more, frames of long-lost relatives. Did they leave the clothesline strung from porch to willow bush, where the black-winged phantom slept at night? Leave Jip, the three-legged dog, jars of beans and corn in dim corners of the cellar? Leave a chalkboard hammered low Words in a kiltered line, Mary, 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 beneath a five-cornered star. Leave marks on stairs where children measured the winter sun's pale reach. Leave a birthmark baby in a dresser drawer to sleep. Home at last. Mother, come to us. Bring your cardboard suitcase across the plains and foothills through the Rockies, down the Fraser, come on the southbound from Lillooet, come to us here. Leave that dreary, endless wind, the dried up sloughs, yellow grass, the ancient bones. Come away from there, we are waiting for you. Come to the cedar, fir and cottonwood. Come to the granite walls, the gouged out rivers, the animals, the wildness. Come to our soil, softest flannel across your fingers. Bring us roots, tough as the cedars on the river bank. Come to Father, come to us here. retreats that I attend with Patrick Lane. Where my story begins. With a Chilcotin horse trader rolling into our yard, pulling a bus stop trailer, and how mother said she could feel the pinto ponies, their noses on the window bars, humming in their spotted throats, keep us, keep us. At the graveside, when the ropes break, and father's walnut coffin slams down into that six foot deep, and how I never want to know how his poor dead body is shook from the fall. On the mountain meadow, lit with willow, alpine spruce, and fir, clear oxbow pools, and glacial air sharp as whiskey, and us wild and giddy with it. With the thimble babies that left the house in the night, brothers and sisters that never quite took, but we loved them anyway, like we loved the eggs in the hatcher for the mystery of them. With Roland at the game, sitting on the hood of his 56 Buick, and him walking towards the concession, his shoulders wide and bony, outlined by the yoke of the red and white cowboy shirt his mother had made, and was always a bit off kilter, but I didn't say. At the one-room Anglican church, where we wait for no cars coming, then creep into the gloom, stretch out like we're dead, each in our own pew, pray loudly to the ceiling for juicy fruit, O. Henry's chicken bones, send sands, a swimming pool in the backyard, and for God not to remember our faces. One thing I remember about Dad is how he loved the land. 
he loved geography, he loved maps. You know, when you write a poem, you just have this tiny little memory that just won't go away. So you put it down and then you sort of fill around it, right? We used to open the maps in the kitchen table, I remember that. This is called the landscape. Father brought small things to us, a pygmy owl from the barn one winter, bats who lost their way in the light, shining golden crab apples from the old tree. You must remember how he held the netted gem in his hand that evening at the kitchen table, explained its perfection, drew his fingers across the russet, dough-colored skin, the low-lying eyes, measured its weight by the heft in his palm. We stood close by his shoulders in that faraway room, and the cherries on the oil cloth gleamed in the electric light. Last week I set my alarm for 4 a.m., but the blood moon was hidden by clouds and trees, and I had no courage to step across the dark, looking up. If Father were here, I would want to ask him, does he know there's a town up north called Kitwangal? This is a, a poem I wrote a couple weeks ago. It's called Riding Lesson. Old leather on the workbench, the smell of horse, oil, and tallow, Pale bitten fingers stroke curves of chestnut, sorrel, all the warm perfection, the knowing and not knowing. Right out across mown fields, now gold towards the west, where evening holds its breath. What I thought I knew has turned on edge. Still the outline of mountain, cathedral, Pauline, copper dome. Familiar as the old man's face, half our lives without him. Why does a girl love a horse? Lean down across the arc of withers, wave of mane caught in your fist. Listen to a heart that thunders. It's hard to be a rightful woman, practice caring. As I was sitting listening to the poetry lecture, the word Kalinsky popped into my brain. The only thing I know about it is the name of the paintbrush I painted with, right? And they're very famous. But where do they make them? Who knows? I didn't know the parts of a brush, but these are what the, they are. The metal part is the ferrule. The, the bristles themselves are called the belly, toe, and heel. And the thing I know about painting is that you clean your brush off, right? And then you put it in your mouth and, and make a point on it. And then it dries beautifully. So this is called Low Sun, Winter Sky. Small-handed women in cap -revoss sit on stools under square pane south facing windows. Narrow backs bent, pluck hairs from the tails of Kalinsky sable. The scent of ungulate hooves that boil in a dented pot, an odor they have not remarked for years. The hissing of the burner they do not hear. They build the brush, one hair at a time, from the inside out place them into a perfect round. Anchor each hair deep on the ferrule, crimp with a tool that has always been anchored at the end of the bench. The handle balanced, painted as red as a taiga berry. When her brush is complete, each woman places it, belly, toe, and heel, in her mouth wraps and wets the brush in the curl of her tongue, pulls it from her mouth through lips she holds in the shape of a perfect O. I don't know how long it will be to keep that 
that's uh, almost 20 minutes, right? Is that about it? Mm -hmm. This is the last one I have scheduled. We'll leave refreshments too, is that great? Okay, sure. This is called Saying Goodbye. Saying Goodbye. On August nights, we used to hear the E and N pulling along the bottom of a hill behind Drinkwater, and that low, ragged note rolled up across the brown pastures that once held your father in Charlotte. My family back on the mainland are sleeping tight beside tall, beside tall rocks, dreaming about black bears in the carrot field and the Eiffel Tower that has appeared in the middle of the barnyard. Because they are good farmers, even asleep they worry. How will they coax the bears from the field, save the carrots, manage the upkeep on the tower, cut fields of timothy and alfalfa, wait for morning? How will I ever be at home here, afloat on this raucous beefsteak of an island, threatening to tip itself into the sailor's sea or slip westward under the plate of Juan de Fuca that is forever gnashing away under our beds. On a Thursday in the north, my friend died. So far away, even a crow would not choose to make that journey alone, across the great Icha and Cadwallader ranges, up where the lay of the land slopes down to the Fraser Plateau and Mustangs run through Aspen. For the children, graceful, blue-eyed, sorrow drops bone deep. Come to the window. Northern lights are leaping into the whole night sky, wavering sheets of madness, dimming even the great W of Cassiopeia. virgin or otherwise, should place three feathers from a barn owl's underbelly beneath her mattress in hopes of inducing a pH neutral state in a fragile uterus. A bride should soak her entire body in a mixture of three parts domestic goat's milk to one part spring water for specific reasons that have been lost. A bride should begin to collect mice feet several weeks before the wedding to be dried, brushed, dabbed with lavender oil, and tied in bunches of three or four to make excellent ear plugs. If no mice can be found, a couple rock rabbits make a fine substitute. A bride should keep a tincture of hemlock close at hand, which if need be can be added by a simple shake of the wrists to eggs, porridge, strong coffee, hand squeezed orange juice. Note the above measures should be used only in dire circumstances, but have proved splendidly undetectable when compared with instruments such as ice picks, skinning knives, power saws, and backyard wood chippers. A bride should have an escape plan well rehearsed an idling car out back, a tractor with a responsive high gear, or shank's mare if all else fails. On the other hand, a bride should look on the sunny side and ignore feelings of claustrophobic foreboding. These may be passing emotions and gradually over many years may dissipate almost entirely. These rules have been learned by careful reading of ancient teachings and should be researched more thoroughly by contacting the regional library of the South Sydney Community Branch and Mrs. Bonnie G. Smedley, who works Tuesday to Saturdays and takes no lunches or coffee breaks, although she really should.
full-length manuscript that I'm <clears throat> sending around is called Down Through the Fields in the House. And it comes from this, which is a prose poem. And it's called Bob's House. The only thing that I really remember is Uncle Robbie's house that used to be across from the root house. Before I was there, I think, or I don't remember, they pulled it way down beside the ditch. And all that was ever left was daffodils that came up in the spring. Bob's house. After the old man died, the boys divided the property, tidied things up, so to speak. Bob took the west side along the Ryan and south of the homestead. Said he always wanted to be on one side of the road and one side only. Didn't like a road through a farm. Well, back then it was mostly ruts. But he didn't like the interruption, is how he put it. So they jacked up the squatty maroon shack and got Dick Black down with his D8. And he did the job for a bottle of whiskey. Probably cheap. It was all the same to Dick. He loved his drink and froze solid in a snowbank outside the hotel pub in 61. Dick's mother told his friends at the funeral she knew he'd be in trouble one day for never wearing socks. When they were younger, Dick and Bob had made every dance they could at the community hall, where Ethel Peach hammered out tunes on a mildewed piano and Elmer Heck blew his heart out on a saxophone his Uncle Winnie had brought from Bavaria. Bob had met Berlin at a dance off country, a rodeo shindig at Alexis Creek, the year he cowboyed for the Lazy H. Berlin had liked his shawtees, and he'd liked the way the pearl buttons of her blouse looked as if they might, at the flick of his finger, wing across the room like bird shot. They'd been married a few weeks later, and Berlin moved down, and before Bob knew it, they had one baby in the cemetery and two up past his elbows. Berlin hadn't lasted so long as that, though. The life of a farmer's wife wasn't what she had expected. Kids hungry, Bob hungry, dog hungry. Kids dirty, house dirty, Bob dirty. Kids chickens laundry garden. Over and over until she had all she could take walked out to the road one Saturday morning and hitched a ride into town on the fender of Martin Fournier's Massey Ferguson and caught the northbound PGE to Lilwick the next morning. Bob was sad all right, but embarrassed and ashamed. Wouldn't go after her, though Dick told him he was an idiot not to. He missed her beside him at night, missed the cackle of her laugh, but he took it as good as he could. Let the kids look after themselves and just kept farming. And now the old man was gone and he was heading as far south as he could get. The house seemed to glide across the fields, never hung up in the swampy pasture down past the barn, looked as perky as a mallard riding a current. Dick pulled it as far south from the farm as it would go, right until the little house was nestled at the foot of the rock slide where the old man had planted crests in the spring that bubbled up through the boulders. Not a spot most would have chosen. It was dark there against the mountain, and the winter sun would be late to reach the porch. But Bob liked it, liked his new view of the mountains to the north, said the change was as good as a rest. The kids never complained. One place was the same as next to them. And the ride down through the fields in the house was the best they'd ever had. Roni was our uncle that uh, died in the Second World War. He's really hot right now. Um, he's buried <coughs> in um, Monticchio. I said to the van driver, can you take me to Monticchio? He said, oh. <laughs> Monticchio. To Roni in Italy. For Uncle Edmund Ronan Miller, born 1950, killed in Italy, 1944. Seventy years now in that warm winter cockeyed <coughs> country. Inside of shores wrapped in pale-eyed turquoise, 
endless, the sapper measured formations, Miles, Miller, Mills, Milton, far from the cliffs of the gray coast mountain and the tumbling glint of Johnny Sandy Creek. The photos you took with your box camera are loose in cardboard albums. Blue chevron corners mark black squares on black. Each picture named in your careful script. Mother, sister, leaving my sleigh to visit Uncle Ed. Cousins fishing, Owl Lake, after the good grizzly scare. Dad, brother, brownie, my, do my new dog, Bob. All the family are gone now, only Cousin Clifford still there on the farm. He would remember you. And the old woman who comes to the cemetery in laced black shoes through the dust of the Italian summer bringing poppies.